Would you mind introducing yourselves and what your position was in the firm and how you got there? Starting uh, over there. Yep, sure. My name's Gary Ellis. Uh, I was service all, all my life. I stayed, uh, uh, did my apprenticeship with Woodgood, um, eventually became road tester, then a receptionist, and then I was service manager. I then ran the coachworks, uh, the university coachworks, which was also in Epsom. Um, and I was with the Coachworks when University Motors packed up in 84. Um, but then I was fortunate enough to be able to purchase the Coachworks. So I actually stayed there for another 20 years. So effectively, all my working life, um, I was with University Motors. And? I, I'm Norman Marshall. I was with Gary. We did an apprenticeship together in 1960. Uh, and so we was on the tools for five years doing all uh, looking after mainly MGs all the time, but we also did a few walls for the police. But our main uh, objection was uh, MGs, and uh, as I say, Gary and I used to go to um, Kingston College and do a, a one day, one night, and a one day college. So we all got our sitting guilds and technicians, as I say, and we were all great lovers of MGs. And in my day, uh, I've done job MGAs, and. Um, so that's where I come from, as I say, and we still love playing in jimmies. <laughs> and you? Uh, my name's Hugh Evans. I went to University <coughs> Motors age 16 as a, just an apprentice. Um, I actually, not a phrase you can use these days, but I was Norman's boy uh, when I went there. Um, I looked up to these two because I'm much younger than them. But, uh, <laughs> But five years younger, or four or five years younger than them, I thought they were way ahead of me. I stayed there for four years exactly until the uh, end of my apprenticeship. Uh, I had already started my own business with my brother uh, called Evans Autos in Cheam, and uh, we sold that four years ago now. And uh, I, during my time as my own business, I actually bought cars from Ray, uh, new vehicles Ray when he was at various different places. So really that's my time. I also went to Kingston as well and did my city and guilds there. But um, uh, that's me. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Ray Mears because he's a member of this Natter. And it's because of Ray and his son Neil and their MGCGT, which uh, they bring sometimes to the meetings, that this is really all happening. Because when uh, I got talking to both of them, uh, about University Motors, which is unbelievable. I used to go there from North London on a Saturday and buy bits for my MGB GT, and I probably met, well, maybe I might have met Pete, but he looked a bit different there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ray, uh, yeah. what was your department? Well, I, I, well, I was in sales. I was um, introduced to University Motors by a guy called Gordon DeVico, who was uh, one of my, the pillars of my working life. Um, and he got me a job uh, at University Epsom, which I stayed, I kind of went through the ranks there, very fortunate, uh, being able to pick up a lot of managerial skills, and gradually went on, uh, I became manager there, and then after a few years successfully there, I moved on to the head office at Hamill, um, and I was general sales manager there until I fell out, fell out of uh, favour with the accountants. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of my existence with the university. <laughs> and finally, Pete Beadle, who's also a friend of our NATA because he did a wonderful um, uh, programme for us um, online um, in which he displayed some of his trinkets among other things, and he, he's uh, an amazing historian. He, he was parts <coughs> manager? I, I was wholesale parts manager. Oh, right. I, everyone's promoted me after leaving <laughs> right. and I was <laughs> parts okay. manager, but uh, I never held that rank. Right, right. Um, uh, and Pete, um, 
you know a little bit about the history of University Motors, because we all go to University Motors, and it's got a, a quite extraordinary badge, um, some of which I think you bought. I, I can talk about it, yes. If I, you would, then. Let me introduce myself. I'm Peter Beadle, or Pete Beadle, as everyone knows me as. Um, I started as a very young student when I was 17 and had a, a Mini, and at that time I had just uh, passed my A-levels but did not want to go to university. So um, as a infill I went to Kingston Polytechnic by then, it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> and did an HMD in Mechanical Engineering. But uh, to keep the Mini on the road I seem to always spend Saturdays standing in a long queue waiting to reach the counter. Um, the lads behind the counter, a gentleman called Harry Kinraid and uh, <laughs> Valerie, they got to know that I, I was quite good at part numbers and suggested that why didn't I go and join them behind the counter and that way I could get staff discount on the bits for my Mini. Needless to say, holidays suddenly uh, came out that I was at the University Motors most of the time and when I uh, failed to get my HMD in Mechanical Engineering because I played with cars too much, uh, I turned round to Stan Gabriel who was then the parts manager and he said look there's always a job for you here. And so I started with University Motors in the early 70s and worked my way up through being the special tuning parts manager because University Motors had a uh, worked with Abington and did, ran the special tuning department and so I met some very interesting people who had some very interesting cars and then I came back into the main parts department worked up as wholesale manager and um, from there along came the word unipart and all of a sudden, all my knowledge and contacts in selling BMC and Leyland parts all went out the window, and I was meant to be selling filters for Fiat's yes. and uh, everything else under the sun. So at that point, I, my parents were disgusted with me when I said I was giving up a, a very good job and uh, formed a small company called Classic Car Services using all my contacts and from there I then joined uh, Graham Paddy who started the Sprite and Midget Centre and we then merged with Cox and Buckles who were the Triumph people and we became classic British sports car spares group. What a <coughs> mouthful. <laughs> uh, that in turn it all came about when we wanted to tool the MGB steering wheel which was used from 62 to 69 the cost of the tooling, even in those days, were £30,000. And so we started negotiating with Moss America to carry on and possibly share the tooling. They had America, America and we had England. They didn't like that idea, and instead they opened up a branch at, at, up in Darlington. And so we counteracted and opened up a branch in New Jersey. Uh, they accused us of dumping MG parts in the American market and we accused them of dumping MG parts in England. So we came to an agreement, they brought us out and we became Moss Europe. From there, it's had its ups and downs. Um, it was bought by a PLC company called Ingham who had made the mistake and bought a, a company called m and International, which didn't have much in value. And uh, so after that, Ingham PLC so sold out to a management buyout, and I fell out with the management, and so it was made redundant. Um, luckily... I'm spotting a pattern here with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we speak our minds. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> um, Luckily, I was headhunted by a company called Anglo Parts in Belgium, and they suggested that I took over a company and ran there as general manager, as a company called ARB. ARB made nuts, bolts, fasteners, cylinder head studs, etc. And for the last 20 years, 
I was living down in Gloucester, I retired three years ago, and the company is still going from strength to strength. Well, That's my history. Yeah. <laughs> um, is Big Ron here tonight? I'm here, yeah. Oh, there he is, there he is. I didn't know who you were, Big Ron. Um, Big said, he sent me an email, I've got to read this email out. It's not actually absolutely on University Moses, but I think Ray said, Apart from having nice work, we had a lot of fun. Indeed. And I think this email that um, Pete sent me uh, to introduce Big Ron. Yeah. And I said, who is Big Ron? Is it Big Ron is Ron Edmonds, MG Services Heathrow, not Heathrow Transmissions. No. <laughs> he was a regular UM Hanwell customer dealing with the Wheeler Dealer, Gold Chain and Cigar, Greasy George Boyagi. One of the staff at Hanwell, who shipped loads of MG parts to Germany and USA under the name of ISP Limited, International Spare Parts Limited, in the 1970s. His company address was very close to UM Hanwell, 99 Boston Manor Road. So, so uh, welcome, Big Ron. Thank you. It's, it's funny. Um, I was first a customer of University Motors, uh, going back to 1971 when I had my first 64 MGB. And, uh, Can you get a new one? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't afford it at 21. Fair <laughs> um, and in 79, I decided um, I'd start repairing them. So uh, I was a wholesale customer of University Hanwell. Yeah. Um, until they ceased and then became Stuart and Arden uh, in Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. Yeah. I remember two guys, Jim and Alan, can't remember their surnames, uh, they were the two guys I used to deal with at Hanwell, and uh, so they went to Stuart and Arden. <laughs> and then in about, uh, <laughs> uh, what was it, probably about... No, so Ronnie being upstaged by uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hilarious. In 86 I decided I didn't want to get my hands dirty anymore, so right. I just got into parts supply. Right, right, very good. And uh, we should also um, fully recovered from COVID. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. Vic Young, who is the technical um, whiz for the C uh, register. Uh, and it's Vic's very, very nice University Motors special that is sitting out by the entrance to the pub. Um, and uh, Vic, I think you've been collecting bits for these cars since 1970? Well, <coughs> since I first walked in with Pete on the special tube. Yeah. <laughs> and when was that a bit? Uh, yeah, it was. It's the early 70s, wasn't it? Very early 70s. Right, right. It was I when Andy was still in short trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and we should um, perhaps go back. What, does anyone know what, I mean, you're the employees, what was the origins of University Motors? I believe it was that, that they sold originally cars for students. I think Pete knows something about this. Well, I um, bought a crib sheet. It was, in fact, an article which I wrote with Ken Smith. Who Ken Smith was a, originally... He's, he was a record producer. Um, he then got a job with the MG Owners Club, for promoting and marketing the MG Owners Club. He fell out like Ooh. everyone else. <laughs> we all fall out with people over the years. Yeah. And Graham Paddy and Pete Buckles offered uh, Ke uh, Ken a job working as promoting us as, mo as uh, classic British sports car spares group. He'd only been with us a year when all of a sudden uh, we found we were being t merged with Moss America. So he stayed on with in America and promoted Moss America uh, for must have been 15 years. He is a very knowledgeable gentleman. He also, for many years, wrote this magazine for the American market and I think it's going to be easiest if I read the article in here to describe... How long has it been? <laughs> 35 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, before I, I start, University Motors in America was formed by a gentleman called John Twist. Yeah. John Twist, a very knowledgeable guy, served his apprenticeship at University Motors Hanwell. Oh. So it shows you where... He was a Brit. 
he was a Brit. Uh, no, he was American. He American came over to England, England right. and served his apprenticeship and then right. went back and stole the name yeah. and opened up. <laughs> right, University Motors was established in 1911, became MG's sole London distributor in 1930 and renamed so until 1968. It is perhaps best remembered for selling its car-enhanced and MG prefixed registration numbers. The co company's chairman and managing director was Major George Bradstock. He was born in 1888 and died in 1965. He had a distinctive, distinctly non-motoring background. Born in Cambridge, he was the younger son of the Reverend J.R. Bradstock and was educated at Blundell's and Jesus College, Cambridge before serving in the Royal Artillery in the First World War, when he was awarded the DSO and Military Cross. He became Managing Director of the University Motors in 1921, and the company clearly was clearly aimed at student and uh, postgraduate clientele like himself. I think that sums it up as how he yeah. started. And what about the badge, the famous? It was the, uh, the merging of Cambridge and Oxford badges, right? And that is where the university. I think we'll see it coming up in a moment. Uh, have well, you got some with you? I do <coughs> have one with me. Right. <laughs> you want to wave it about a bit? Well, I think there's a picture of it as yes, the slideshow goes. It'll come around eventually. That car was recently for sale in Belgium. That is how Colin found it. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah, because I delivered to them. <laughs> They wouldn't take my bid on it. <laughs> <laughs> Pete had the nails to nick a few bits when he left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kept by finding them in salesmen's drawers. Uh, so uh, salesmen uh, used to knock off at six o'clock. Oh, 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 right, okay. Well, 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 you so never said that. If, you, like, <laughs> <laughs> if, if <laughs> you want to pass it round, yeah. as long well, as it comes you, back, I don't mind. Can you give us a hundred pound deposit? What else you got in there? Well, this happened to be on one of the salesman's oh, desks. No, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was it yours? I can't remember. So, uh, <laughs> I stand by my earlier point. Yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I think I'm going with the three tins. I've got nothing on this, has he? <laughs> there is the, the thing which everyone wants these days. There is a repro version of it around, but it does not have the pegs on the back. Right. So it that's is the just bonnet a, badge. That is the bonnet badge if you want to Ooh. pass it round. Right. Now that's pass. another hundred pound deposit. <laughs> <laughs> it's in very good condition. Worth an original that, that is a, that is original. Right. It's worth 150 quid. I'll give you the hundred quid deposit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> I bought one of those. Uh, from the most amazing Epson. Many years ago, I thought it was in front of my car. It's not a real. I mean, my car isn't a real University Motors car. I've got one in the room. Oh, well, right. Remember what you paid for it? Sorry. Remember what you paid for it? Oh gosh, no, like, dang. Uh, I've probably got the invoice somewhere. But <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, hold on to the front grille on the pegs with right. you know the um, little ferrules you hold um, like choke cables and things with. Surprised it hasn't gone about. Yeah, well, that's right. perhaps it will. Do <laughs> wondering that. I didn't bring. I didn't bring it with me this evening. But it's, uh, yeah. And other little bits and pieces marketing. We used to have a, a company which always knocked on our door just before Christmas and said, well, you want to get presents out to your favourite clientele. <laughs> and one of the things was a University Motors Epsom 2661, and it should have a clock in there, a little electric clock. <laughs> I'm afraid to say that fell by the wayside, but I did manage to keep the uh, stand with University Motors on it. <laughs> Interesting, the day I left in 1971, I took my clock-in card with me. But sadly, I don't still have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but I do have the clock-in machine. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring it with me. I'll find the card. I'll tell myself. I've got the machine. You've got the machine? <laughs> Your, is yours the electric one? Mine's the mechanical one. No, no, one. mine's the original. The old, the, 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 I clocked in with it in 1963 for the first time, <laughs> yes. and then uh, it packed up while I was service manager, uh, and I acquired it, and it still goes. Love it, love it, love it. 
Yeah. Gary, I'm going to come to you uh, down there. We'll have a little little look at the stuff in a minute. Yeah. Uh, there's another you're little teaser. Like so. you're in trouble, you? Gary, if you were involved well in the coachworks department, I mean... Um, Reluctantly involved. Yes, but you're probably the right person to answer this question. Um, I mean, at a time when uh, BMC, um, BL, whatever it became, um, sold most of the cars on the roads in, in this country, um, but I personally suffered from uh, the rust experience. Um, I, I bought a demonstration when I finally got some money as a young actor, because I, I worked on play school, and we got uh, 450 pounds a program, and we did five programs at once. And I'd be earning 12 pounds a week in rep. So I went mad, I said, I've got to have an MG, and I went into our local dealer, um, and the manager happened to be a patient of my father, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I've, got, I've got a car for you. Chrome bumper MG. I said, no, 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 no. I want the new one. One of the rubber bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> what a mistake. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> within six months, it was a demonstrator. It had about a thousand miles on it, and he did me a fantastic deal because nobody wanted them, you know. Um, but I wanted the modern, you know, rubber bumper. I didn't know anything about ride heights or emissions or the fact that it was nowhere like uh, the early cars. We were celebrating 60 years of the MGP this year. And later on, I drove one of the very first ones, what a difference. Um, but within six months, both the sills were rusty uh, through the harvest gold paint, um, which didn't quite match. And I went back to them and they had to fix it at their expense. Is this something that was common? No, it wasn't common. Um, all, all cars in those days suffered with corrosion. Uh, I wouldn't say any BL or Austin Rover product was especially prone to it. Um, but yes, it, you could, there were certain limits as to what you could claim back from the factory under warranty. Uh, corrosion was always a very grey area um, right. and it was always difficult to, to claim. Because, uh, I mean, I remember when Z-Barting came in, that was the, yeah. that was the that big, yeah. big thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and did that sell well with mm. cars? Ray would probably answer that. Yeah, more, I mean. it did sell very well. Yeah. But of course, z went inside or underneath. Yeah. It didn't go on any of the, the final colour coat. With no. those little black all the box, all the box yeah. sections. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 it's brilliant. Yeah. But I mean, it's hardly surprising when, I mean, I've got a photograph at home of the yard at Abingdon with bodies from, um, just come on lorries and they're, si they're sitting there untreated in yeah, the rain. That, that, that was the key to whether it, you had a long term corrosion problem, right. how quickly they were processed and how thoroughly they were primed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many thanks. <laughs> Ray, your end of the business. Yeah. It was so. Um, it was fantastic. Peter was saying, you know, that we used to clock off at five o'clock. But any, anyone knows who's in sales here knows that it doesn't. The clock doesn't stop for selling. And I, I used to find myself in all sorts of funny, peculiar places, dealing with people that perhaps not might have always been the best people in the world. But it was a deal. Uh, I used to. The I was programmed to. Uh, because I was a certain sort of person, easy going and that sort of thing, to handle uh, people that were uh, personalities and, and all that sort of thing. People that, that think, oh, Ray Mears will deal with that one, you know. So, and, uh, but Ray, had you had any training how to deal with No, 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 no. It was it's just your wonderful natural, natural, natural nature. ability to wrap it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of the first ones I can remember, which is quite unusual, was uh, it came down from head office that I had this. Uh, lady who uh, bought an MGB or MG Midget wanted to take delivery of it. I was telling the guys earlier on tonight, and it was Bernadette Devlin. Oh, yeah. the, and I, I could never, I never really got to the bottom of why it was all to do with politics and uh, all this sort of thing. Uh, and it was, it was quite an eye opener because I didn't know how to take her, she didn't know how to take me, and the whole thing was done fairly quickly, signed here. And, Thank you very much. Goodbye. You know, and that was the last we ever saw of her. But, the but Ray, what was Bernadette Devlin doing in University Motor? No idea. No idea. <laughs> it was just one of those things that whether someone at BMC or, or later, if they were at the time, was uh, it came from their sort of 
you know, most of the office the sort or of person you want to be associated with. I know, with, I know, absolutely. With, with your I mean, cards. I mean, yeah, because she spent a lot of time blowing yeah, them up. Oh, I mustn't say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she, after, shortly afterwards, she slapped the face of an MP in she did. Parliament. So, yeah. uh, uh, which wasn't very good. But anyway, the other, there were lots of people. Rodney Mars, the football player. Great. Oh, how was Rodney? We always found, never saw him wearing shoes. Mm, yeah, always exactly. came in in barefoot. Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, never saw him. Yeah. He cut his foot, he couldn't pay. No. Don't know, we just didn't worry about it. I never saw him with a pair of shoes on when I called at his home, delivered cars or whatever, you know. But, and he had he didn't drive, his wife drove everywhere for him, so, which is, you know, a funny thing. Because there's the famous um, Alf Ramsey story about Rodney Marsh, you've probably heard it, but he, he played absolutely brilliantly, but he wouldn't carry out any orders, you know, he just did his own thing. And mm. uh, he played an international at Wembley, and at half time, uh, Ramsey stormed and said, Right, Marsh. I'm pulling you off at half time. He said, oh, that's great, a QPR, we only get oranges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about your criminals that you mentioned? Oh, well, yeah, there's, I was going to go, funny enough, it's, it's, it's all coming back now, really. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the funniest things that uh, ever happened to me, I got involved, we, we did a, a, quite a few vehicles for a company that was associated with the Beatles. And... We had to, I got, I had a contact, Gary at um, uh, Harold Radford's, and we organised a mini, a mini Deville, and it was for Cynthia. Ray, what, then, what was special about the Deville? What actually? It was just, it? No, it was just. I think it was fashionable. Peter Sellers had got one. You know, it was quite fashionable. Were they? Time. Was that a separate company like like Radford mm -hmm. or someone? And Radford or wouldn't pick it. Well, wouldn't pick it. No, it would, yeah, well, Radford. Uh, yeah, it would be Rad How Radfords. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And anyway, that's the, the people. And I, it's, you know, we got involved with this. Anyway, I got involved with it. And we picked the car, and picked up, and we had to be delivered very close to here. Actually, it was Black Hills, just down the road. Mm. And um, drove in. With, I had the chauffeur with me, and we we drove in. And I, I knocked on the door. A lady in a. Um, Sort of a maid's outfit. Open, uh, oh, yes. Open the door and said, Oh, please come in and uh, they'll be with you in a minute. And then John and Yoko Ono appeared without any clothes on at all. Absolutely <laughs> stunning. Um, Ray, that was, I, George, that was St George's Hill. Well, that's right. Right. <laughs> and I looked and I thought, this, this is unusual anyway. And they introduced themselves and uh, they said, um, You know, these are the keys. And actually, it was for. For John Lennon's first wife, the car, and they were just Cynthia, 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 Cynthia Lennon, Cynthia. yeah, who was lovely, and, and uh, well, that's yeah. another story. But um, <laughs> and the, the the ironical part of this, I, I was blushing like mad, you know, as you can imagine. <laughs> And then they say, but we'd, we'd like to give you a little thank you for sort of this. So oh they, they got this <coughs> they got this LP in sort of brownie sort of thing. And it, on the front of the LP, it had them start naked, and on the back, it was the rear view of them. <laughs> so, uh, and they said, what's your name? Oh, Ray. Oh, so right, okay. So, so they said, to Ray, best wishes, John and Yoko, in this black felt-tip pen thing. So, that was really kind. That's nice, you know, nice little thing, you know. I got it home. And my, I said, look what I've got today. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and she said, we can't have this in the house because we had two young children. If they ever saw it, they would think it was very rude, you know. And so it went in the bin. Oh, <laughs> oh, right. About six months ago, one went up in New York, I think, and yeah. it was sold for 7,000 quid. <laughs> <laughs> that, you uh, had a very rich customer. <laughs> right, I think that, that, that LP was called Two Virgins. Hmm. Well, so that's I think right. it's yes, that's right. It would have been St George's Hill. Mm. Yeah. Yes. No, no, that's definitely, definitely Black, Black Hills. Really? Yeah, yeah. he was def they were definitely there. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. Yeah. Whether they were renting it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. his, his famous house was in St. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I could take you to the house now. Where he had the psychedelic roles in St. George's yeah. Hill. Yeah. 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 Oh, they tried right. to get him thrown out of St. George's Hill because of the car. Well, th that was another story. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's all sorts of stories you know, about that, you know, about the Beatles. Now, our Welsh yeah. guest, Hugh, who claims to have no accent whatsoever, <laughs> um, tell us some funny stories about your time on the floor. 
Well, my time at University Mode, as I say, started when I was just 16. Um, and uh, it was not a particularly eventful apprenticeship, but I was, I'd like to say I was diligent. I was there on time. I clocked into the, the clock on the correct time and left at the correct time. I can remember a couple of things that were obviously the initiation ceremony with any new apprentice, and that was that you'd be strung up on the, on the uh, crane, the engine crane, and wheeled round to either the grease bay and uh, <laughs> greased um, and or put in the wash bay. Uh, that was the sort of thing that would happen. Um, my time, other than that, as I say, wasn't overly uh, exciting. I, I enjoyed what I was doing. I learned a lot. I was under these guys, without doubt, and I learned a lot from these two. I remember Gary had a very special Morris Minor uh, convertible, which he may allude to later on, Interesting, it had, I think, a 1275cc supercharged unit. 1215. 1215, sorry, supercharged unit. And the buzz on a Friday night was, for me, at just 17 years of age, uh, now legally able to drive, can I go get your car, Gary? Can I go get your car, Gary? <laughs> and he'd give me the keys to his Morris Minor. He didn't trust them to everybody, but he gave me the keys to his Morris Minor. I just walked 100 yards or whatever up the road, Church Road, mm -hmm. uh, to drive it back down. He probably realises, but I tried to get it to go as quick as I could in the 100 <laughs> yards, but, you know, that was it. Um, that was all good fun. I had a good time there. I was very fortunate there. I left there to the day of the end of my apprenticeship because I had already started my own business with my brother, which I alluded to a moment ago. Um, I'm delighted to say, in fact, that in my own business life, I've served Norman with a motor car many, many years ago. <laughs> which he was telling me today has still got and loves it. It's done 230,000 miles, I think. What's you, the car? Yeah. It's a Toyota Land Cruiser. Yeah. Um, I bought many cars from Ray uh, in his professional career and me buying new vehicles for clients. Peter, you told me... Yeah, I bought you a, a light, uh, <coughs> sorry, a Surf Blue Mini with wide uh, cream wheels on it. There we are, wheels. okay. Oh, so I'm pleased to say that and Gary and I have remained in contact. I pass Gary's house sometimes in the summer. We have a quick chat. I think my biggest claim, claim to fame was within uh, University Motors. As again, as I say, a young 17-year-old oik. Um, one of the traders that used to visit quite often to buy the old cars, the old part exchanges, was a Mr. Bloggs, we'll say. And I particularly wanted this car and it was a Morris Minor Million. Now, hands up, everybody knows what a Morris Minor Million is. Not very many. Uh, to celebrate the millionth Morris Minor, they built a Morris Minor Million. They were only, I believe there were only 120 made, I'm not sure. But they were all painted in a lilac colour with cream leather interior. And this car was up in the workshop, because the workshop was upstairs at University Motors. And I made myself busy around a chap called Sid Berryman, who was the sales manager or fleet sales manager, um, a fairly elderly gentleman, and I s was naughty and I said, oh, Sid, can I, can, I, can I buy that car, Sid? Can I buy it? Because the dynamo is gone and this and that is wrong with it. Dynamo is a word that not everybody here will know about. <laughs> okay, well. um, and he told me to shush, go away, go away. My intention was so that I could try and buy the car and not the trader. The trader was there, as I say, I don't know the father's name, but he was with his son, Adam Faith. <laughs> and there would be a lot of people here, necessarily, or some people who won't know who Adam Faith is. But I managed to get the car. 35 quid I got it. Uh, every panel was damaged. I repaired it. I rebrushed the dynamo. <laughs> um, and that was my biggest achievement, perhaps, in terms of, for me personally, other than the work that I carried out, um, and I think it's, it's interesting, it's interesting as we look along this line here of us lot, often people say, oh, what university did you go to? You know, Cambridge, Oxford, blah, blah, blah. And I just say, yeah, I went to university. Oh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? I said, Motors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're all the same, exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. So, but, um, Hugh, Hugh, I must say um, that uh, going back to your initiation, <laughs> I mean, now you'd get millions well, for the initiation. So. You'd get millions for the initiation. I'd get millions as well. And I'd get a lot of money for my most minor million. Uh, because there was one of those I can still... I keep looking every now and then. I Google MFL 908. I 
I repaired all. I gave it to a body repair chap who, who repaired all four wings and the doors because it had gone through gaps that were too small. And if you remember, the wing went into the door. He straightened the front and rear bumper valances. He straightened the grill bars and repainted those in a cream colour, which was original. He painted all the rest, as I've said. I bought a second-hand boot lid, which was black, from somebody out of the exchange of Martin Leatherhead, for £1.10. shillings. <laughs> I put that on and he painted that. He did all that paintwork for me for £12. <laughs> <laughs> I, sold, I put the car up for sale... Um, for £165, I paid £35 for it. I put it up for £165 um, in exchange of Mark, which was the only medium really to use in those days, and I wasn't getting any calls. The second week, I wasn't getting any calls. So I did the typical motor trade thing, and I started a panic, so I reduced the price, and I probably reduced it to £155, I don't know. And in the end, I reduced the price, but subsequently, at the same time, I, I changed the description to Morris Minor Thousand, not Morris Minor Million. Yeah. I should have done that in the first place because the phone didn't stop, because nobody knew what a Morris Minor Million was. Mm -hmm. I wished I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen one last year at auction. I think it made £8,000. <laughs> I think. Oh, no, ten. It made, sorry, it made ten grand. Yeah. There we are. That's mm -hmm. So, Gary, we're talking about some of your cars. Tell us about some of your cars, particularly your Morris Minor. Well, <clears throat> my first ever... I was riding motorbikes. I was a bike biker. Um, but I got fed up with sitting in the pictures with wet jeans, so um, <laughs> I eventually looked around for a car. Um, I was just starting to get into hot rodding, so I thought I wanted something that I was going to give a bit of attitude to. So I bought a Morris Minor convertible <coughs> in 66. It's my first ever car. Um, and I've actually still got it. Um, but it's not a Morris Minor anymore. <laughs> um, it, 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 over the years, it's had so many engines, so many transmissions, axles, brake setups. It's been lots of different colours. Um, but I was very friendly with uh, another Epsom dealer called Jeff Allen. Jeff Allen used to race SD1 Rovers, the Vitesses, and they were in the mid 80s. They were very successful, beat everything going, even even all the, the BMWs and everything. Um, eventually, the due mainly to a court case, um, Austin Rover and uh, TWR Tom Walkinshaw Racing, who built the cars, decided that they were going to pull the plug and, and stop racing them. And Jeff approached me and he said. Um, they're going to auction off all the bits. There's loads of stuff going. Do you want anything? Well, I had just started my own company, bought the coachwork, so I didn't have any spare time um, or spare money. Uh, but the next weekend, a hire van turned up at the coachworks, <laughs> absolutely chock a block with everything, including a Tom Walkinshaw built Rover V8. Uh, rear axle, uh, AP racing, 12 inch discs. Um, gear track, five speed dog leg gearbox and I stood there and looked at this stuff they wanted peanuts for it so I thought right I'll okay. take it and then I thought right well, now's the time to put that into the Morris so the Morris then was turned into a racing TWR Rover Vitesse with a Morris minor body on it there's plenty of room under the bonnet I mean you see the original minor you start looking for the engine because it's, where is it yeah. well, my and the bonnet's pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a picture on my phone, but we can't. I'm sure we can't. Uh, yeah, get it unlike, there. unlike the MGC, of course, where they were trying to cram yeah. an engine on it. We'll yeah. come to that in a moment. But I've still got the car. I still tinker with it. Um, I drive it whenever I can, and, and I haven't got to the end of my road when I drive it. When I think, crikey, why don't I drive this more? It's so much yeah. fun. But I spend more time on my mower now cutting my grass. <laughs> Sadly. Uh, Pete, I'm coming back to you because you've had some very you had some very interesting cars in that era, which you told us about on Zoom. Well I being a special tuning parts manager, some of the parts did get onto my mini pickup. Did they? Yes, I can't understand why. <laughs> but, um, the car well, ended up with a well it was a thirteen hundred GT engine which had the extra two studs. So it's virtually Cooper S style uh, with 
twin engine halves and uh, I was a member of the local motor, motor car club and uh, so we used to take it grass track racing and uh, it was very successful mm -hmm. because the back end of the pick uh, pickup is so light mm -hmm. uh, you just use the power unit to steer the car really. <laughs> um, I then bought a Cooper S Mark III Cooper S in fact through, I bought it through, all the, through the business? No, this was just pri privately. Right. Um, I, it was a guy who was selling it. It was a guy called Benny Marshall, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'd had a, a lady who brought the, uh, the car, it was a write off, because the lady had gone over the deep left sign and had taken the whole of the sump off the gearbox. <laughs> um, so that, that ended up with another. 1275 lump in it. Well, in fact, uh, Benny sold me the spare engine to go with it <laughs> and the subframe. Uh, long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was, a, it was good value for 250 pounds. <laughs> and uh, that ended up with uh, the registration number Never Trust Women Twice. <laughs> um, because uh, I was sharing a flat with a gentleman called Nigel Tolbert Wagstaff. And in fact, his uh, purple MGB GT V8 is in the picture of the University Motors with two other V8s. Right, right. And uh, what else have you got in your box there? Now you um, come down to this end. <laughs> in the box, um, talking of. Um, Does the key fob and the uh, badge come back? Yes, they, they will return. That's extraordinary <laughs> with this nice. It's on eBay within an hour. <laughs> That's That's already sold. Slow. <laughs> Hang on, you got a bag as well. Oh, <laughs> In here. Oh, Invoices from University Motors, right. University Motors Coachworks, budget rent a car. Oh, um, oh, oh, due, to, <laughs> due to me loaning the car to um, my way, my MGB GT, which was a '66 car, I, I lent it to one of the fellow parts manager, uh, parts guys. Um, the thing was, I didn't realise he had a glass eye. Uh, so he couldn't see much out of his left side. Is this true? Yes. <laughs> he, he then uh, borrowed the car and uh, up on the ups and downs uh, managed to right off the front of an 1100 which had a crossroads. He then apologised to me for the dent in the rear wing and he said, uh, by the way, I haven't got any insurance. Uh. So I was left with the, uh, the joy of telling my parents that uh, A, my car was damaged, B, there was another car which was damaged, which we need to pay for. And so the 1100 ended up at Coachworks. Um, we, I got staff discount there. I got staff discount at Budget Rent a Car to uh, keep the guy happy. <laughs> and uh, I got one or two bills. Uh, to repair the uh, said 1100. Read some of the prices though, because it just, oh, make, it just well, makes you weep. Let's, here is uh, my, my parents had a rally elf, uh, or that was mother's car, and uh, it was an automatic, and so here it is. To fit a reconditioned engine was £34. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was 1973. Well, and at the bottom of this invoice from University Motors, it does say parts supplied by owner. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, have you got any invoices for Graham Paddy? Uh, Graham Paddy, uh, I had one or two. I, I remember you sent one something to uh, me recently. <coughs> there's, that's a, a Sprite and Midget Centre invoice to, uh, from University Motors, and then that was the advice note. As you can see, the supply was nil, 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 and then two washers and three bolts. Because <laughs> that's um, where I first met you, of course, Peter, Graham, you know, when I was doing uh, Who's Graham Paddy? You know. Who's Graham Paddy? Graham Paddy worked at Wadham Stringer's Rygate. Right. But he... Your rivals? He was, uh, we had rivals all around us, Page Motors, yeah. uh, Lancasters, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Graham Paddy ran the body shop down there, but he was really a mechanic. Right. Where did he learn to be a mechanic? Downton Engineering, right. oh, wow. yeah. uh, and so he had a very fast midget, which he wrote off against a tree, and so he started selling all the bits and pieces, and realised he was making more money out of that than out of um, 
uh, sort of running uh, the body shop. So yeah, he right. started the Sprite and Midget Centre down at Bear Green in Dorking. From his home? From his home. Because well. I used to go around there and drop stuff off to his home. But here we have one of his, uh, Ashley was one of the original He's my first suppliers. He's customer, Grand Paddy. When you, who did you work for Goblin, was it? Or? No, it was, I was doing part time, mm -hmm. but I was doing it, making the parts in 1974, just after I left college school, you know, and, uh, and I was buying parts off of Graham, and I said, Graham, I could make that part for you. And he said, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the start of it. His very first pi uh, panel was the little air po a post repair panel, which always rusts out where right. the hinges go on to the uh, sprite. Well, mentioning Downton, I'm going to come back to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> does everyone know what and who and why Downton were? Because they're very, very connected to University Motors, and particularly to the MGC specials that we're going to come to. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little wee bit about Downton, and people may correct me if I've got it wrong. Um, based in the village of Downton near Salisbury, um, and once a year they have the most fantastic cuckoo fair. I have to tell you that if you wanted to sum up an idyllic English village, Downton is the place, because it's a single street, much of it is thatch, the backdrop is sumptuous Wiltshire hills, and if you ever get a chance to go to the cuckoo fair, uh, which usually May, maybe. Yeah, probably we can. Um, you'll see a lot of C's and minis and all that there because they have, they'll have a little uh, motor show apart from uh, what goes on down the high street, which is mainly cider tasting in my case. Um, <laughs> stalls, it's just an incredible event. But Downton, originally uh, there was an agricultural engineering business there um, in the 19th century. Um, then it became a garage, and eventually it was bought by Daniel and Veronica Bunty, Richmond, in 1947. And uh, the Richmonds were, felt that they were a bit of a cut above. I mean, uh, uh, Daniel always claimed that he only went there because the salmon fishing was so good. Uh, they both liked the high life. Um, and in the 1950s, they were both terrific motorsports, hill climb uh, enthusiasts. Um, and they started producing parts and bits to improve the performance of ordinary cars, not, not, not you know, big flash cars, but ordinary cars. And they fell in love with the BMC A-series engine, which did lend itself to improvement. Um, and then along came the Mini, the Austin Mini 7. Um, and they did fantastic jobs on those. If you wanted your Mini souped up, you went to Downton. Um, Daniel's reputation spread. He was, you know, if he breathed on something, it went faster than anybody else's. And uh, he became consultant to BMC and earned vast amounts of money through that, um, particularly with the co competition department when BMC was in its pomp during the late 60s, when they won everything, whether it was the Healy, uh, but particularly, of course, the Minis. Um, and it was successful throughout the 60s. And they also produced kits for the C, the a uh, late lamented MG uh, C, which was only produced for two years, um, and in fact UM were offering those upgrades while the car was in production, and it really, uh, you know, I've driven one or two of them, um, and but it really <coughs> is, is a revelation from an ordinary C with its three-litre misbegotten engine that I think <coughs> the was supposed to lower the stroke on, and uh, it came back from Morris Motors where he was working and uh, it's well hang on, you, you haven't lightened it up, uh, it, it's just as tall as it ever was, what the hell are we going to do? So, well, um, I'm not lowering the stroke, make a new bonnet for it. And the new bonnets wiped out most of the profit because of the special pressing, but it gives it that lovely look. We're going to see some in a minute, they've, they've been going around here. Um, at the rather sad end, I mean, like all great dramas, you know, this is the du -du -du moment at the end of EastEnders. Um, Daniel was very keen on drinking and began to lose a bit of interest in the business. And in 1974, he just dropped dead from a heart attack, quite young. Um, and Bunty um, said she was only living for her bull terrier. And when the bull terrier died, she committed suicide the next day, uh, leaving a note for the maid saying, don't come in call the authorities. Um, but 
the UM uh, connection is very strong, and the Downton engineers all gather at Downton. They have Downton Motor Show, the Cuckoo Fair, if you ever get a chance, they go <coughs> there. Um, and they have started up again um, in the 1990s. They started again, didn't they? Uh, I think the name of the company <coughs> the name was company. used. Yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> um, we've seen, uh, I don't know if you chaps could turn around, maybe, I don't know whether Tim can fashion a kind of stop on some of the extraordinary MGC GT. The, we have to say that probably um, the unsold C's, I'm told it's 176 at the end of production, I don't know if that figure is correct. Um, University Motors got landed with them, or did they want them? They did a deal. Hang on, they did yeah, a deal. Hang on. Whoa, hold on a second. <laughs> there were 147. 147, I'll correct okay. that yeah. Sidney Johns, who was the financial director of uh, University Motors, a brilliant man, very, very clever. He only ever did things, uh, organised things by committee. We formed a committee of sales managers and salesmen, the, the top group elements of salesmen. We got together in his office. That's great, Tim. And he said exactly this, that we've got this opportunity to buy all these cars, GTs and Roadsters. It's going to cost this. What do you think? And we all put our hands up and said, go for it. Can you remember what the discount was? Uh, he, that's, that was his side. We never got, all we were doing is marketing. Right. But he, they must have sold them at a loss to... No, 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 no. When we turned round to get up out of the office, Sidney John said, you've made this decision, you've got to sell them. No, I meant... The MC. The MC. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure they, got a they made an absolute yeah, national yeah, yeah. whole thing. Yeah. You know. So who had the? I mean, I don't know. If, does anyone recognise this car? It's one of the director's yeah, cars. Yeah, recognise it. But one year ML, yeah. Um, who it's decided what bits went on, or did you walk in and say, "Well, I'd like one of your specials. I'd like this, that, and the other." Well, that was the sound of one with wild wheels. With a, we've got a a, a, a a vinyl roof on it. I don't know. It's probably got a with Barstow sunroof and, it, and the modified grill. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, it's because we had two, we had two UMLs, UML1 one and one, and UML. one UML, and I'm not sure, I can't, whether, that, that looks like, uh, that actually looks like, when you look behind it, it looks like ha a Hamble. That was at Hamble, yeah. which was taken. Yeah. Interestingly, it's, very few of them were fitted, but that has little chrome yeah, pieces right, yes, under yes. underneath the yeah, headlights. Yeah, yeah. They yeah, were yeah. made by a company in America called Amco, right. yeah. and they yeah. were brought in. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you've got a this gentleman over here. You've got an MGC out here, haven't you? With no. The, no, that's it. Who's got that's the one with the fluted bonnet? Is that you? That's it. And that is that is absolutely taste. <laughs> they should have all had those fluted bonnets. They need it, the fluted bonnets. <laughs> <laughs> no, just the actual beauty of the car <coughs> you know, is part of it. You know, it's as well as a sort of bread you know, bulge. It's lovely, lovely part. You had that done, did you? The fluted? Yeah. I've still got the original bonnet with a badge on it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> actually, looking at that picture, yeah, yeah. that is actually one of the later C's because the side lights are yeah. very close to yeah. the grill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a quiz question. I'm oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you were asking. No, no, we're not having a quiz today. Does is, anyone recognise this one? No. That one is, again, whatever the customer specified, right. they did. And so they actually took the grill out of a later uh, MGB because that was a change point mm. in 70. Yeah. To their fish mouth grill and was put on an MGC. Was that an Epsom car? It's an Epsom car, that one. Yeah. Is that Antelope, that car? Yes. Yeah. And who thought about the red on the bulge in the roof? And was that the customer? Again, I'm not sure on that one. Right. But no. that, that, that would be. I don't know. It's a Chelsea Walsh back in the side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was also. It, I took pictures of that oh, right. in, no, sorry, in 19. Uh, at the 50 year anniversary oh, at Blenheim right. Palace. Right. Okay. It might not have been the original registration of it. No, I don't think it is. No, no. And the indicators. And the indicators. Yeah, Some people say the indicators are the wrong way round. Yeah. The factory uh, in Australia fitted them that way, and in UK they were fitted the other way. Yeah. And on the works MGC lightweights, 
one had them one way and the other one had them the other way. So uh, yeah. when racing at night, the people in the pits could tell that's which that's NGC great. was coming. Oh. Now this one with its... Um, that's Colin's car. Strange. Uh, Colin should have been with us, he got Covid. He's on the... Is he still on the phone? Yeah, he's here, he's here. He's he's, 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 yeah. Hello! Oh, who's there? Hello, Colin! Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 This is his car, <laughs> but... Uh, the, the, uh, it's a shame you're not here the headlights. Um, but these, we were having a debate about where the headlights came from and what was the conclusion? Vauxhall Viva. No, it wasn't Vauxhall yeah. Viva. No, they were Corellos yeah. and they actually were marketed by uh, Corello. Oh, sorry, CB. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. get it right. Yeah. CB. Yeah. They were marketed by yeah. CB as, uh, at one of the motor shows and mm. University Motors said, oh, we'll try it on a couple of cars. In fact, I, whether it was University Motors or whether it was Wood and Pickett who said, yes, we'll try that first. But there was some debate about we whether this was actually did, University. It's funny, we never found out who did the conversion. I was absolutely convinced that it was yeah, Benny, right. because he was an absolute artist at reshaping things. Well, didn't and it, didn't it, it, it didn't. We had two. That was David Rice's demo, as far as I can remember. And I had a white MGB with square headlamps. As well, which was a roadster. Roadster, that's right. Yeah. Now that's appeared in this month's uh, Safety Fast magazine. Really? Somebody's brought it with a view to restoring. Oh, to restoring. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Got yeah. black stripe. It's a white one again. Yeah, yeah. black stripe. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's got round headlights. It says in the uh, that's article. That's right. Now I met, funny enough, pure coincidence at a boat club do that I do, the scouts thing that we go to. I met the guy who actually owned. He bought it from Epsom. I, did, I wasn't the salesman. Derek Price was the salesman. Oh, we yeah. sold it to him. And um, he couldn't get replacement lamps for it, so he had it That's converted right. back to round lamps. Yeah. But that was the, the CD had like the CBA um, concave headlamps on yeah. it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah. the uh, same, it's this month's uh, safety fast. There's a photograph of a car in New Zealand that a uh, friend Colin uh, has commented about well, that has also got rectangular headlights. Interesting thing is it's left-hand drive and I think the way Colin has worded the reference to this car, I'm not sure that it was uh, uh, somebody else's build uh, on the same style. Right. But surely University Motors never sold any left-hand drive. Uh, uh, what well, we did on oh, yeah. yeah. What, MGB yeah. GTs? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. yeah. We had quite a uh, John Young, who was uh, yeah. at um, BMC, the oh, office long later. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it comes so how it comes out of the woodworks. So incredible. Yeah, yeah. Out, yeah. Yeah. he used to handle, I used to handle all the export stuff oh, for, right. for Epsom and Hamel. And Bellum used to sell yeah. them. Yeah. Yes, as well, that's right, yeah. And that's yeah. got different uh, uh, side indicators. Yes, on the front. a lot of it was BFPO stuff, you know, mm. so... Uh, oh, Ray, who, who thought these oh, headlights oh, were a good idea? It's recorded. It's recorded. It was, oh, right. Yeah. Go on, Pete. Yeah. It was just offered, and it was an idea to tr give it a yeah. try. Um, at the same time, the those headlights were used on certain minis, mm -hmm. and also on the Unipower GT, mm. which they only built about 75 of. Yeah, mm. a yeah. very lovely vehicle. Yeah. It's quite a common thing to change headlamps, yes, too, absolutely. because if you yeah. remember, Guy Salmon on the XJS, they took out the rectangular headlamps and put two, two, uh, four headlamps in. Yeah, uh, yeah. they did that yeah. quite a lot yeah. on yeah. Guy Salmon yeah. XJS. Yeah. I saw that uh, also there was a car up at um, <coughs> the NEC in November uh, that was for sale, E Type, where the owner was dissatisfied with the power of the headlamps and had it converted to four. Yeah. And it looked really, really weird because yeah, we're so wrong. used to the E Type wrong, yeah. having two. All wrong, yeah. Well, I think it's time to uh, throw it open to the floor. I don't know, uh, Neil. Um, do you think Colin might have a contribution through you as an interpreter? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so here we go. Might he have a question? Yeah. Colin, we're coming on to questions. I wonder if John was asking whether he had any that he'd like to ask. Or any comments. Yeah. We'll have to pray, see Neil. We'll yeah, so uh, Colin's asking about the different two number plates, UML1 and 1UML, mm. and how they were used, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence, or, uh, you know, there's no sort of formal documentation on how that worked. Yeah, they, they, they got passed around um, 
David Rice had, I think it was UML1, who was the, he was the director at Epsom, but Gordon DeVico at Kingston, um, they had UML1, uh, and also at Hamwell, I think it was passed backwards and forwards. It was regularly, for, for promotional purposes, it was it was swapped around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a demonstrator car, and yeah. as soon as it, if someone wanted to buy that car, yeah, that's right. it was sold, and the number plates was moved on to another new yeah. car. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's and there was also yeah. UML2, and yeah. originally yeah. it was University Motors who owned MG1. Huh? Yeah, before yeah. it passed yeah. on to John Formless. Yeah. John Davis, who I right. should say is on, on the SEC committee, and he's the trophy yeah. history finder at the moment. Yeah, this, is, this question has nothing to do with that. It, so it, it very that. much relates to University Motors. A good friend of mine for many, many years, um, going back to secondary school days when he caught polio, um, had a Mini Cooper. Uh, I come from the Epsom area, incidentally. And um, his car was uh, maintained by your good selves. You didn't actually supply it. He bought it uh, probably around about 1967, 68. It was a 1965 Mini. And he found an invoice the other day with the name of the service manager, E.J. Bond. Yes. Yeah. Eddie Bond. Eddie 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 yeah. We were this, talking about this, him earlier on. Yeah. This was for sill repair. In 1969, which really goes back to what John was saying yeah. about uh, uh, corrosion, so the car was barely four years old. Um, anyway, you guys sorted out for £18, 12 shillings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is, and I'm sure he remembered the name Peter Beadle, and he said, you, uh, I'm doubting you won't remember him. His name was Bob Jones, and he was a disabled driver. It must have been one of the first Mini Coopers that was converted to hand controls. And your workshop guys were absolutely brilliant looking after it for him. They fitted a Pico exhaust, so when he went down Epsom High Street, <laughs> 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 but um, it's a small world. We were saying yeah, earlier about yeah, falling out yeah, of people. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't always yeah, play. Yeah. But um, it wasn't your supply in the car. But I uh, don't know whether any of you remember. It was a red Mini Cooper with a black roof being converted to hand controls and no, I, I, do, I do remember a hand control Mini Cooper, but I couldn't tell you if it was that no. <coughs> Well the police were always stopping him and Bolt was speeding, wondering how the hell he ever drove yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it was, well, Feeney Johnson I think. Yeah, yeah it would have been Feeney Johnson. Yeah. Time, yeah, but uh, there weren't many Coopers no, at that no, time. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, as I say, well, I have, I have to say, from the sales angle, I mean these guys were absolutely <coughs> geniuses at their business you know they all all three of them knew exactly mm. tuning hand controls nothing would be too much of a problem for them they were absolute they were gold dust you well know. he you know he was uh, i was only talking to him the other day and um, i'll see him next week he said oh he said mention my mini cooper too he said they were brilliant the way they looked after yeah, it yeah and yeah. uh you know he wishes he still had it the uh, sure. workshop was very lucky and at a very early time they managed to install a rolling road <coughs> at University yes. Motors Epsom That's right. and okay it shook the whole building. Yes it did. <laughs> 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 And, the and it was scary to you. <coughs> yes it was. Yeah, yeah. That's funny you should say that because he, uh, I think he may have had twin cars on it. I can't remember. He would have had twin cars. Yeah, if it was yeah of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Cooper and the Cooper S. And that was one of the things, I wasn't going to go into that now detail, but well, one of the things he commented about when he got it from uh, Thompson's, I think. Uh, Thompson's of Wimbledon. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it, was, it wasn't properly in tune. And once it went through uh, your workshops there, it was a different yeah. car. To balance the carburetors on those was quite an art, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You get balanced correctly. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of some of the success on sales was due to, in major part to the service facility because people who regularly bought their cars from us, and there was a, a number of regular people who knew that was, we negotiated a deal to buy it, but they were in good hands oh, absolutely. subsequently. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so the whole thing 
moved along very nicely, you know. Well, we used to spend Saturday afternoons in uh, Wright's uh, grill. Oh, oh yeah, right, obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we weren't grill. allowed in there wearing overalls, we were <laughs> thrown out. <laughs> uh, we, we should say uh, that Colin, uh, who's with us through the miracle of technology and the, the amazing battery power of Neil's... Yes, I'm on charge. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is his car, which he's just restored. And I was lucky enough to be at Village Garage. Uh, Brian Corbidale can't be with us, he's got COVID. Um, uh, and when they took these wings off um, to redo the headlights. And I don't think it was done by University Motors, judging by the panel beating. I think it was a wooden, a wooden the, picky, I would have thought. Because yeah. you would have to, those wings have that flat bit, <coughs> have to go through a wheel. Yes, to, it's a flat Because you, do, you don't panel wheel, you have to wheel those to yeah, profile them. Certainly the welding wasn't up to UM standards. <laughs> Any other questions? And it's a slightly rhetorical, because I might hopefully don't oh, answer yeah. some of them. But um, you know, some of the colours that you've told me about, and some of the you know extras that people ask for on the specials, things like seat covers, I think you've mentioned in the past. Do you want to share some of those ideas? So, pistachio, was it green? And the so, yeah, we were talking about it tonight, funny, earlier on. How were the colours chosen? Any ideas how they might have chosen colours like that? Was that the it's two brothers, right? The two brothers, yeah. We, we, uh, I, I, we you know, because we're being te televised, so I think we, we weren't perhaps yeah. think too much. They were they're a long of, dead. Couple they're of long years, dead. they're long dead, but you know, one of them was murdered, so you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but they, the two brothers, so identical twins, and so they bought a, a pair of MGC GTs specials from us, you know. Uh, one was pistachio, and the other one was an orange colour, which. Now, come on, chaps. It Gary. wasn't. I, I would. I would have said. It's it Gary, Gary Ellis Orange. Gary Ellis Orange. It wasn't Blaze. No, it wasn't Blaze. It wasn't Blaze. A Gary Ellis Orange. <laughs> we'll settle for that, because Gary's is uh, is his minor is orange. So uh, was was. What colour is he not now? now? It's red. It's red right. now. Is it? Oh, it's it's very fashionable. <laughs> well, it was painted over thirty yeah. years ago, but yeah. it's yeah. red. Yeah. Well, that's interesting about paint because um, certainly when I've had cars painted, you know, in the last ten years, um, looking at British racing green, for instance, there seemed to be about forty shades of oh, yeah, many, many, many. Now, why shades. was that? Many shades. I mean, the manufacturers had all sorts of different shades. No, but I mean, BMC on MGs seemed to vary from car to car. Well, they did. I mean, there was a colour for Morris 1100s, I remember when I was there, Connaught Green, but you'd had about yeah. four or five different shades mm -hmm. of Connaught Green. Mm. Why, how, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's was it the ICI delivery? I think it's down to the paint, ma paint, paint manufacturers. Paint manufacturers, probably at the time, they were tinted and all What's a German one? I can't think of the name of it. Because you. Pleasure it. Glazure it, that was Glazure it. it, yeah, Glazure it. Yeah. The ICI oh. would have su supplied the paint to the factory. Yeah, put it up. There you are. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> That is it, yes. Yeah. Looks standard. Looks standard, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's wearing fat, is it, uh, Gary? Fat boy. Fat boy. It, it's, it's, it's got fat on. It's got 450 fat. 450 fat. Right. And the, the plates yeah. off it, I've now got on my daily driver. Yes. So I've had the registration, I've had that car. For about 53 years and the number plate. Well, not that car, Gary. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That car. Yeah. It is that car, yeah. it's not yeah. that car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it modifies. Well, we were, we were, saying, we were saying about this earlier on that when, when we were kids, um, we used to go up to Epsom Downs, Epsom Racecourse, and along the back behind the, the stands was a marvellous mile stretch of road. And we used to, um, Warren McDonald, who was one of my colleagues there, we used to stand there with a microphone and a tape recorder, and Gary used to go up and down this, uh, and he used to absolutely, he was doing 100 miles an hour when we were going past that. Was, that was our it test trip. Was, that was, was our test trip up there. It yeah, was up there, yes. It was a tremendous, you know, it was a lovely experience, oh, dear, you know. The sound would echo off yeah. Cemetery Road. <laughs> <or> <laughs> the the appropriately named Cemetery Road. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. prayed hard as you went past the cemetery. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Can I be a bit controversial? Um, I am a V8 owner, and I was reading up in uh, Graham Robson's book, Mighty MGs, uh, to try and muscle up myself a bit of knowledge on his seats. And um, I got the impression, just reading mm. a passage or two in the book, that he was very fond of the MGC, and he made a point that it was the fastest car that Abington made, 
and then later on the V8 came along. It's a bit of an afterthought. And I'm just curious, as having had all those cars, if you had a choice today of buying an MGC or a factory V8, what would you choose and why? What are the pluses and minuses you would say? Are you saying a factory MGC and a factory MGB GT V8 yes. or a modified MGC? Just straight out of the factory, you're in the showroom and they happen to be making both cars at the same time to choose. I'd go for the V8 any time. I would buy the V8. Yeah. Mm. I'd buy the V8. It's, it's unfortunate but because they got, MG got it complete, or Lane and whoever it was, got it completely wrong. You know, they, they many, made many cock ups over the years. Um, we were talking about it, my son's MGC the other day, the loom on it is so short, the, the, the junctions are so short that over time they corrode and you've got to peel them back. And they never left, uh, mm -hmm. never left enough uh, space for, and they did this time and time again. But and that was, that was saving, the, it was the accountants, of course. Yes, that's yes, right. They yeah, saved 10p yeah. per loop. Yeah. 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 You can say in the book that every shortcoming with MGC was fixable, and obviously people have been able to fix them since. Yeah. The factory would not listen mm. to yeah, the feedback where they could. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We have two MGC experts here. Mm. I think Victor is, in his son's car, is now getting something like 245 brake horsepower? No, yesterday it was 240 horsepower and 240 foot pounds of torque <laughs> at 7,500 revs. Excellent. Yeah. Which well, says that they keep winning the uh, well, CVA yes, championship. Well, five years ago at 50, Andrew won the BCBA championship outright against all the 3.9 V8s yeah. in a straight line or around corners and since then every year we've changed the oil and yeah. he still puts it on pole and he still out them yeah, yeah. and he's just I've just built over the last <clears throat> three years two years a sea roadster full race concourse <laughs> and it'll be coming out on the track <laughs> all I see right in there, yes. No, he's only got one standard. Whatever's the highest, yeah. whatever's it? the best, is it? That's what he spends money on. He goes for Dad's it. help. <laughs> well, yeah. To be honest, that is a, a seventy thousand pound MGC, isn't it? Probably, yeah. If you add in up all the bills. Well, don't course. tell Vic that for God's sake. <laughs> no, don't tell Gladys. <laughs> no, no, don't tell <laughs> But yeah, but uh, it's yeah, you know, I've been tweaking the seat since what the first ever BCV8 race in my blue seat. I was on the grid, and I put my foot down. All I've done is got a set of overalls, a set of leather gloves, put some print holes on. You can go out racing. Mm. And I overtook cars on the grid, and I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing? I got a clue. <laughs> Those were the days when you literally just went out. Mm -hmm. yeah. A few years later, in your sta virtually standard MGC GT. You were called a mobile chicane. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you, they never knew where I was going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, you got victories. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, the history of the sea really sums up what went wrong with the British motor industry, um, because um, I mean, probably people know um, when Leonard Law went in there, he hated. DMC had some forming out in 1930 over something. Once he got his hands on it, I mean, they knew they wanted to produce something to rival the E-Type, um, but on a budget, of course. Um, and at the same time, the Austin Healey 3000 was coming to the end of its life. It was produced next door to uh, MGs at Addington. Um, and they said, well, Lord said, well, just put a different grill on, on them. We'll have the same car, different grill. And of course, uh, Healy, Donald Healy, said, well, I'm not having that. Mm. So he went off. Um, and they were left trying to find an engine. The V8 was available. I mean, people had already done it. Um, uh, but Lord said, no, no, that's going in the Rover 2000. You're not having that. Uh, and uh, as I said, it went off to Izzy Gonis at um, Morris Motors to try and find an engine. And they came up with the three litre, which actually in the Princess is actually a very, very good fit. It's a lovely, lovely, lazy, mm. brevy engine. If you're a bank manager or a doctor, it was brilliant. And I know several people have got them. Um, mm. But to try and shoehorn it into the C, I mean, the whole of the front of the C is completely different to the B because you've got to hold the thinky engine up. And the seats are higher because you've got a hump in the passenger compartment and the driver compartment you've got to get over. 
I mean, it really was a dog's dinner. But they're loved because you can do so much with them, as Vic demonstrates. And I've driven one of his race cars, uh, not the one that Andrew drives, but uh, the black one. Mm. And it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. Because <laughs> obviously he's taken all the carpet out, because Vic doesn't really do carpet. <laughs> 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 yeah. A bit of, bit of brush that on the front. What he's interested in is the engine, the suspension, the brakes, and all that. But they're so exhilarating when you get that power. I mean, you've hardly got a touch the accelerator down the end of the road. Well, and that's the one I built for my granddaughter for her yeah. 21st. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my grandson's already had his 21st, yeah. which is the yeah. UM Special. Yeah. Wow. And that's Lovely. the same specs. Um, with Charlotte's car, of course, I got fed up chewing gearboxes regularly. So I thought, hmm, about T5 Cosworth box. Get an MGC gearbox, chop the bellows in off, weld the plate on. Mm. Bolt straight on. Thank you very much. Gear lever comes up in standard place. He makes it sound so simple. <laughs> 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 you just have to do it. <laughs> I have an MGB GT, which is rather bumper, and I've still got it. And I used to take it to University Motors to get it tuned. I couldn't afford to have the whole service, but I used to pay to have it tuned. And it never ran better than when you had it. But I do remember going down there, and there being police cars in there being serviced. So presumably that was quite a nice contract to have. Yeah. But I wondered if uh, you had any stories, you know, when you were uh, fun and games you had doing the police contract. <laughs> Well, we, the police association goes right back to the war, Second World War. The Met Police needed an engineering base outside of town to, uh, to look after their vehicles. And they chose that the picture over there shows the Woodcut Motor Company. And that's who they chose. And that's who Norman and I actually started with. We, we didn't start working for University Motors. It was Woodcut. Um, Woodcut had a fully equipped machine shop that could handle almost any type of engine overhaul or anything else and that association stayed and yes we used to have we used to supply probably about 60 percent ray of, yeah. of oh, yeah, police yeah. cars yeah. pandas to yeah. Yeah. all uh, and we used to get cue cars in yeah. as well and from the outside you'd never yeah. tell but mm. the daimler 250 saloons just darts yeah, yeah darts, used to come yeah, darts, in with yeah. and they even used to hide the police radios inside the glove yeah. box yeah. Yeah. so yeah. any any villain looking through the windows, wouldn't see anything. And I, I never forget many countrymen in the state with gun racks in it. Yes. And, and we used to get all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we used to have a lot of the vans, yeah. well, the yeah. Black yeah. at the time, yeah. and the EA, or the, the relatively new yeah. truck that followed the original yeah. Black Mariah was called an EA series van, yeah. filthy yeah. things they were, yeah. uh, horrible diesel things. And none of us like working on those. No. With, uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the, uh, the Panda cars. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, all yes, the Morris the, the yeah, Well, when I finished, uh, end of seven, late 71, they just started bringing in the first Panda cars, police Panda cars. And if you remember, police Panda cars were Morris Miners, mm -hmm. the very first of them. So they had a run out, a bit like MGC, they had a run out. They obviously had a deal with the factory as a run out of these 1100cc Morris Miners. They would arrive painted in the Bermuda blue with the white doors, the lamp, the lamp on the roof, they would, we would have to mask up the word police on the door because we were talking about this earlier at dinner. I think we were paid as lads something like £1.10 or whatever it was uh, to deliver these cars up to Hendon Police Centre uh, after work. Yeah. And I have to own up, we were only young and we had these half a dozen panda cars, tramp, axle tramping up, <laughs> up to Hendon and trying to race these police panda cars up to Hendon, but everyone got out of the way. It was quite, <laughs> it was quite comical, but uh, I'm not suggesting that's a, a good yeah. thing, but it was yeah. one of the it's, things. It's worth having a close look at these pictures because yeah. when you look at this, this building is a cutting edge Bauhaus type building. It's it absolutely fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, it was right. fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. building. And it really lost, it, lost yeah. its third story. Um, by the time we started yeah. in 63, so I don't know why that was. Mm. It's funny, it's, um, listening to, to Huey here, he reminds me, we, it was a team effort to get all these cars over to the police uh, engineering, work, whatever they did with them over there. And I can remember one day, uh, one of my colleagues, Warren McDonald, and we were doing a, a run with about six or seven of us, and we said, 
ironically, we had to go past the end of Heathrow, the, the main runway at Heathrow Airport, and we delivered, and we timed it. We knew exactly what time it was. We sat on the end of the runway, and we saw the first jumbo jet yeah. come into Heathrow Airport. Yeah. And I tell you, now, of course, you don't even think about it, but in those days, mm -hmm. that was, was a bloody great big, big thing. thing. Mm -hmm. It was massive. Particularly when it was coming in, you could feel the jets. Well, funny enough, right? I was road tester at that time, yeah. and I was up on Epsom Downs watching what, that, yeah. and you could still see the tailplane yeah. when it was taxiing. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. It was so big. Yeah, yes. Another silly. We did have a chap. I won't mention his name as we're being recorded here, but <laughs> Austin 1800s. Um, this would be <laughs> one of his party tricks was to take it up Downs Road and do this with the steering wheel until it gathered momentum and it let go and the car would be going up down, 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 on his own just roll do you remember we used to do that? Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. I met him actually just before Christmas yeah. in Chapman. Was, was that, that Steve Weller? Well? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Keith. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, one of the things about the University of York, Woodcote Motors building <laughs> is that I think it was designed by the architect Coulston who was put in prison for uh, oh. fraud or evasion. But one of the really nice things about the building itself, all the showroom windows on the front are actually concave. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And Incredible. The light, like, that way, you didn't get a reflection yeah, of yourself. No. Yeah. You could see through and mm. see the cars like the in Simpsons, the showroom. Uh, I've Simpsons never seen a showroom like that. No, it was amazing. No, that was unique. And it, it was just like the old yeah. triangle yeah. yeah. garage, which yeah. you would was you had when you were a kid, you had the ramp up the side to get into the workshop or in, on the Tryon garage, it was to park to the, your cars on the roof. And, and at we, 16 you had to go and open it in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Long chain, yes. Yeah. Long chain. Yeah. Being a partsman, our parts department was downstairs. Yes. Yeah. And the worst thing was on a snowy morn morning, yes. the cars would arrive, they'd go up into the workshop. Yeah. The workshop was a bit warmer. The snow dripped off the cars <laughs> and the tarmac sealant on the roof between us, the parts department and the garage wasn't 100% and the number of times we go to a bin to pull out this nice steel item only to find a rusty remnant because yeah. the water had sat in the plastic trough Classic. and the part was ruined. They were good days, though. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. like the interior of some BMC cars. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. I will say that um, in '73, Abingdon flooded, and quite a few MGBs did have to have repaint. And also, ICI at the time were using a light green undercoat or primer, where the top coat just didn't take to it, and so. Uh, quite a few cars had to go for repaint because the, the primer just hadn't, mm. the top paint had not healed to the. the ingress primer. of water and MGs of that era not good. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, folks, that that finishes the formal part. Unless there are any other questions. Um, when, so just go on, John. When did you say the building was originally put up in Epsom? Uh, well, that's 1935. Yeah. Um, I've got another picture at home of Woodcut Motor Company, not in that uh, building in 33, so I would say probably 34, 35. And then it, it had an additional story on top? At that time it did, yeah. It had a little office up the top at the front of the right hand side. No, I was looking at some old photos of it. Mm -hmm. and underneath the ramp was one of the workshops, and also, uh, sorry, one of the actual machine shops where it was Les Burkitt, the engineer. And yeah. if, if the, oil, the used oil tanks weren't uh, pumped up regularly, they, they would overflow, yeah. and there was Les in two inches of oil, <laughs> <laughs> wading across to his massive lathe where he could turn out anything. Waiting to dip an apprentice in it, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, apprentices in oil, very briefly, yeah. we had an oil bay. And if any of you had, yeah, there. too, yeah. If anybody had an Austin 1800, if anybody ever had an Austin 1800, I can tell you exactly how much engine oil one of those will take, <laughs> because one of the apprentices at the time, do you remember? I will remember it very is, well. Uh, what was the name of the guy? Was it Bobby? Who was in there? With the, who was the? No, I think I remember who it was, but I won't. Say no, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think who the name of the oil 
mechanic was. Jackie. Yeah, he would turn around and say to this lad, fill that one up with oil. Glug, 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 glug. And it started. 32 pints went in it, but it, it did actually start. Because he literally filled it up with oil. He did. He, 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 he filled it to the brim. He filled it to the brim of the rock. Oh, well, you know, you're young, you learn. Can I say, gents, it's been an absolute pleasure, and you are welcome to come back with Ray uh, any of our second Thursdays. Um, and join us and tell us some more tales. I mean, you've just been so lucky to have had that experience. Yeah. Well, yeah. University of yeah. was a great place. It yeah. was a good yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's it's every boy's dream, probably yeah. around this room, to have worked in a garage yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Then you're all actually being, well not you, Vic, but <laughs> being paid <laughs> for <laughs> playing. Who worked in a company called H.A. Saunders? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yes. I know the name of the company. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Were you? Really? In the 60s. Yeah. yeah. Um, How long were you there? I was there for St. Paul. I worked there as an apprentice. I started in 64. I was 16 or 17 at the time. And um, I, I've, I've mostly worked on minis. But yeah. I also worked on the special tuning. Did as an the engineer. The MGs, oh. the Triumphs, all special tuning and everything. Yeah. I've still got lots of stuff at home. I should bring it in. We'll have to. You should bring it in. I should probably never yeah. seen it. Sorry, what's your name? Anthony. And, hi. And, um, do you have an MG now? I probably not on two. Yeah. Well, not, not an old. I've got an MG, MGF. So have I. Um, There's nothing wrong with them. 500. <laughs> well, they're 20 years old now. I mean, they're. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is 2008. Yeah. Did you say 2008? I've got the uh, pump here, funny enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, yes, but uh, slap them up while you can, folks. The MGF is going to be worth a lot of money. <laughs> well, I hope so. well, no, I mean, uh, it's a hand gas. I mean, well, let's just throw it away. Or oh, two, we'll take it, throw it away and buy another one. Yeah. It's already two grand. I also used to do a lot of the MGB V8s, taking the engines out and doing the gearboxes on them. Right. And that was yeah. a hell of a job. This is, this is Ian's area, where is he going to? Mm. Yeah, this is Ian Hell's area. You didn't put the engine back, with the, the, back with the shims on the mount, so you started it up, and you put it on the chassis. Oh, you have to get it absolutely right. Well, See, this is what's going to continue for as long as you like. I'm going to draw the form of our leaving. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.